The streams flow, twist and turn through the foothills of the Victorian Alpine range. Like veins, they pump life through the lush green landscape. The river provides endless momentum to the water as it runs over smooth stones worn down by the millennia of time. Along the banks of the stream, insects hum as the morning sun slowly illuminates the landscape. Already trout are watching them, silently stalking any insect which may venture just a little too close to the water's edge. Trout force their way up current, dodging and weaving through the shallow runs and deep pools, endlessly seeking the gravel beds where the spawning process can begin. The Goulburn River has a cruel end for the migrating fish, where they are met by solid concrete and a reinforced steel wall. The weir wall which divides Lake Yildon and the Goulburn River has the stature of a medieval fortress. Metal cables and pulley systems are used to release the water from the lake back into the river system. The quaint country towns surrounding Yildon and the mighty Goulburn are as one would expect. The pace of modern living hasn't infiltrated these tight-knit communities. Instead, focus remains on the fishing opportunities in their pristine waterways, and who caught the biggest fish is often the talk of the town. Today we're heading inland to do some freshwater fishing. I've got my mate Mornay here, who's a very keen trout fisherman, and we're gonna see if we can catch some nice browns. But first stop is the Goulburn Valley Fly Fishing Centre. After receiving directions, we pulled in. I was in need of some expert advice and this was the place to get it. The centre is unique and the only trout specific lodge in Australia. The vibe is relaxed and leisurely and the house border collie sits on guard duty by the fire. However laid back the centre is, it is also a source of highly specialised knowledge. Whiteboards and diagrams, preserved insects used for identification and all sorts of other info are there for the curious trout angler. So David, we're here at the Goulburn Valley Fly Fishing Centre. I suppose first things first, mate, we wanted to just ask you a few questions about trout in the area. And I yeah. suppose the first thing is, when were trout actually released here? Yeah, so the early releases were 1881 in the Taggarty area, but the main release was in 91 when they let them go in the Jamison River. Okay. At which point in history then did this area become known as a good trout fishery? Pretty hard to find out when, but okay. it looks like it mostly happened after the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War. Oh. It was still hard to get here prior yeah. to that because yeah. it was a long drive for the day, so mm. when, when the guys came back from the wars they all wanted to get fishing again, so it sort of kicked this area along. It was known, but it got publicity a bit after the war. Various writers wrote about it, so that's when it really started to move along as a fishery. So what do you see is the main difference between saltwater fishing and fly fishing for trout? Oh, I think I have to show you that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> this is the difference. Flies, yeah, the flies. big difference. Yeah, everything we do is matching the size of an insect. Sure. We're not trying to look like a, a small swimming bait fish. These are insects mm. and they're good copies of them and they're good enough to fill trout. Yeah. So David, I see up on the wall you've got a huge trophy sized brown up there. So. What are the big fish you'll catch around here? What size and what are maybe the more average size that we'd expect day to day? Yeah, well, they, these are big guys, of course, so, but they're rare now. Yeah. Yeah, you, this is the good old days, if you like. Mm. Uh, so you're looking at eight, 10 pound fish, mm. whereas today, in most of the rivers around here, mm. three pound, four pounds are very good fish. Okay. Average, maybe two, thereabouts. Okay. So David, there's a perception that brown trout are cunning. Is it true? No. <laughs> no. Simple answer. Sorry, no, no. No trout are cunning and no trout are smart. Actually, no fish are smart. So what's the secret then? How, how do you catch them? Well, you have to think about them as a quarry and mm. you're hunting them. Sure. You have to then think about what helps them survive and why you find it difficult to catch them. And most people think below the water 
is another world and they have no idea whether the creature that's living below the water can even see out of the water. Mm. So first of all, he can see vast distances and we're very clumsy at sneaking up on him. And then when we fail to catch him, we'll idolise him and we'll call him clever or smart. A common misconception. Mm. We're also told by our parents to Shh, be quiet while we're fishing. Mm. Show me the fish with ears. Oh. <laughs> they can't hear us either, but they can see us exceptionally well. And they're great survivors based on movement outside of the water system that they live in. Oh, okay. And that's what keeps them going. After discussing all things trout with Dave, we move through the lodge examining previous conquests and the methods used to achieve success in conquering them. I slowly gain more appreciation for how special this fish really is to the towns of central and northeast Victoria. One subject we still hadn't broached was the Black Saturday bushfires, and I cautiously raised the subject, not knowing how it had affected Dave or his family. When you're fishing around here, you can still see evidence of the Black Saturday fires on the hills. It was obviously a big event in Victoria and in, and in Australia, and also had a huge impact in this local community. How did it affect, A, your business, and B, the fishing in the streams around here? The fish suffered like everybody else. Uh, the rivers virtually filled up with silt or ash, if you like, and it covered the bottom, so the fish were struggling to find food. The people were struggling to find a house to live yeah. in. Yeah. So it was a terrible time. It recovered, but it took a number of years for the fish to get mm. going. The Shire itself took a massive tourism hit, yeah. and it was massive. It just literally, people were too sad to come here, too embarrassed to come here because mm. of the devastation that the fire had called. Mm. So tourism, fishing tourism and general tourism died and then initiatives were starting to be put in place to try and draw tourism back. And one of those initiatives was to partly stock the Goulburn in, in, with low numbers of fish. The rivers took nearly four full years to get rid of the ash that was in the bottom of the river. And that was because we were in a drought period as well and we weren't getting flooding winter rains that would generally flush something like that through. It was just sticking in all the corners and it deprived the fish the, the fish that survived, even some of the fish got cooked in the river because yeah. the water got that hot, but the fish that survived struggled for food yeah. for a number of seasons. Literally, they couldn't get anything off the bottom, so they were feeding on the terrestrial life coming in off the banks, and the first year there was no grass beside the rivers in many yeah. cases, so they were doing it tough. Yeah. After a full rundown of the local trout fishery, I bid farewell to Dave at the lodge and prepared to begin my own journey chasing these prized fish the next morning. The sound of the stream softly gurgling through the morning mist was only interrupted by the iconic call of a kookaburra. Walking along the bank, I knew whether we caught fish today or not, the day would not be wasted. How could it be? The temperate bush was dotted with spotted gums along the rocky shore, and the sound of the river's current dissolved all thoughts of work and day-to-day -day city life. We're here at the Rubicon River, and I'm with my good mate Mornay, who today is going to be very much acting as the guide, because I'm a C-grade trout fisherman, and Mornay's hopefully going to put me onto some fish. So Morns, today we're going to spin a few hard bodies. Is that yes. the general plan? Hard bodies, spinners? Yeah, hard bodies, try and get that aggression bite going. Um, yep. We can try a few other techniques later on as the day gets up, but cool. we'll start off with some hard bodies. The Rubicon River descends 693 metres over its 26 kilometre course. Fueled by the nearby ranges, this particular stream has many deeper pools, a classic ambush spot for brown trout. With two anglers working as a team, both sides of the stream are methodically probed. This is a very effective technique and improves the chance of a hookup. I always thought trout difficult to catch. With their cunning and majestic reputation, I was concerned a trout novice like myself might find them hard to catch. 
After hooking my first Go fish on. for the morning though, my confidence soon grew. There we go, a little brown. As you can see, a little male brown. You can see the milk coming out of this fish and that's really why we're here. It's mid-May. We've had a bit of rain in the last couple of weeks and that means they've probably had the first cool flush of water down the river, which is the important thing for trout because that's what signifies for them the time to run up the river and basically spawn. This is a little flats minnow lure. It's got a pretty small bib on it, so it's a shallow diver. We often use these really traditional trout patterns at this time of year. So as you can see on this trout, one of the pectoral fins is full, whereas the other one's been clipped. That's generally a sign that this fish has been bred in captivity. For me, most days fishing are spent on the ocean. The yawing of the boat and the sound of the outboard, a constant reminder that I'm not on terra firma. It was a pleasant change to have waders on and to scout a river from the bank. The sharp cold of the mist stung the extremities, but the constant walking warmed the core. But we were still hunting trout, and the river wasn't giving away its secrets. So we found this nice little waterfall here, and as you can see, there's a beautiful bit of deep water out here in front of me. But the waterfall itself also creates these little eddies, as you'll see on the far side of the pool, which is great because you get the fish sitting in that slack water, and essentially you can cast your lures across, drift them back through the white water, and pull them across in front of their nose. The minute waterfall was a perfect trout ambush spot. It had a deep pool where the swirling water could disorientate any unlucky bait fish or insect which had taken the plunge. It was a perfect setting for a nice brown. I worked the hard body lure, watching it zig and zag, tempting any territorial trout to strike. A little bubba brown, but the brown trout all the same. Again, that one's Got great condition. Very little guy though. He'll be going straight back. So nice and gentle. There you go. He will live to swim another day, no problem. Mornay chose to work the whitewash at the bottom of the falls. Being more experienced as a trout angler, I knew it was likely he could score a good fish. While fishing on the river like this, there's different areas to fish. I'm actually fishing a run and a pool, and above me is really fast water, and below me is real fast water. You'll find that the fish will move up and hold in these areas, so these are likely spots for fish to be sitting and just resting up before they make their way up the river. Um, you can cover them really methodically with shallow and deep diving lures, but it's the main thing is to just keep working the pool. Don't just one or two casts and move on. Work it, and you might even just get an aggressive bite out of it. Yep. That's a good fish. With the treble hooks lodged, the trout fought hard to shake them off, dodging and weaving in the current, the trout constantly outmanoeuvring Mornay's effort to land it. Don't get in that fast water. I'll, I'll give you a hand oh. once. Yeah, let me jump in. Now, now. It's a nice fish. It's a good fish. I'll bring him in. Just remember that's that really light leader. Just let him go. I'm going to get him in this duck. Watch your feet. There we go. With the fish in the shallows and out of the fast water, we managed to secure it. Beautiful morns. That's a ripper. It's amazing, mate. Like, trout are an introduced species, and yet there's few species which probably get the protections that trout do. Obviously, we're only a couple of weeks away now from the closure of the river, so you won't be allowed to fish in here, which is Queen's birthday weekend. Queen's birthday weekend, it normally it closes. So. Yeah. And what do we have? How, how long is the closed season for trout? Uh, it's about three months, reopens again in the first weekend of September. It just gives these fish a chance to actually spawn. Fisheries no longer introduce fish into these rivers, so catching a fish like this, which is a breeder, best to just come catch and chuck them back. This is a female brown, you can tell she doesn't have a kite as the males do, but also- that, What's that, the hook jaw on them? Yeah, the males get the hook jaw or a kite, the females don't get them. And you can also tell by the vents on the back end, um, when they get ready to spawn and stuff, they get sort of extended, a bit irritated. So in the Rubicon here, these fish are obviously traveling up river. Where would, the, where would most of these fish live for most of the year? The, 
some big fish will stay in the river themselves in deep pools. Yep. The majority will come out of the actual Goulburn and make their journey up the river. Okay, cool. Well, that's a beautiful fish, much healthier looking than the one we caught earlier. Removing the lure, we took utmost care handling the fish. For most anglers, taking a moment to admire a fish before it is released is all part of the conquest. We chase these fish with such passion and drive, and sometimes those special few seconds before they are released back into the wild are what make a day or a trip worthwhile. I'll just release her, put her back, she can go on her merry way and go and do her spawning thing and we'll come back and catch her in springtime. These icy waters aren't a deterrent to the trout. In fact, it's the opposite. They form an important part of their breeding cycle and life. Without trout in this area, during late autumn and winter, most people would simply bypass the region without a second to stop and appreciate the Rubicon and her story. For us two anglers, we couldn't be happier. Walking was no longer just about A to B. We slowed down, we watched the river, studied the pools and cast around, enjoying the area. So morning, the fog's just starting to lift. We're starting to see bits of the mountain through here. It's a pretty beautiful morning. Fantastic. You and I both do love our saltwater fishing. Nothing like coming to a river and just getting back to the grassroots and enjoying a day out in streams. Both Mornay and I lost track of time as we cast our lures and stalked the banks. Each pool full of anticipation, could this be the one with a trophy brown lurking in an eddy? I remembered David's advice, these weren't uncatchable fish. It was a case of thinking like a fish, keeping our noise and visual presence low. So when you're trout fishing, rod and reel set up, there's plenty of different options out there. Some guys, when fishing rivers, do like a much shorter rod, so they'll opt for your five foot six, even six foot rod. Today we're using slightly longer rods, they're about six foot ten, but still a very nice little spin rod, as you can see from the casting handle, so there's not too much here in the, the butt section, so you can cast all day. This is a little Samaki Zing. It's uh, rated four to eight pound, or two to four kilo, which is sort of a general all-purpose type setup. Guys will use these rods, not just for trout, but for your brim and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you can fish lighter. A lot of guys will fish a one to three kilo rod, um, but this for these conditions is fine. We've got a 2,000 reel, six pound braid, and we're just using four pound leader. This is a little stunner reel, a Tika. Uh, goes nicely, again, it's an all rounder. You could use a smaller reel, a 2,000, even a 1,000 size. There's no problem with that in the streams, um, but this is a good all rounder. We use it on a few different rods and it will catch fish all day long. The Rubicon descends from the Great Dividing Range just east of the township of Buxton, then flows in a northwest direction, fed by the runoff of the Blue and Cerberian Ranges. The sun was higher now and illuminated the riverbed below the water's surface. Getting lures deep into the underwater space of the trout is a sure way of finding a bite. Buck browns are known for their territorial aggression strikes. Working the entire area, I cast around the current lines as well as the areas featuring shadow and light. Trout are fickle and may only strike when the lure is in a certain part of their territory. I have often heard anglers say, I got the fish on the last cast. Sometimes you just have to put it right in front of their nose at the right moment. Hooking up, I played the fish out slowly and evaded the submerged timber. We were using very light leader to avoid the keen eyesight of the fish. The trade-off being that I could not put much pressure on for fear of the leader breaking. In areas with plenty of snags, this can often cost you fish. I'm just going to give myself a bit of room here. So there you go, another beautiful little river brown. 
as we came up to this pool, we actually spooked a whole school of fish. There must have been, I'm guessing, four or five fish that sort of were riding close on the bank, and we literally walked up to where we thought we might cast, and they shot out from under our feet. So we've waited four or five more minutes and sort of kept casting the area. I've put a couple of lures a bit further upstream, and I just saw this one just come out from behind a big dark patch, turn on the lure, and there we go. So you can see in this beautiful little morning light, really lighting up the scales and the dark brown spots of this fish. Absolutely sensational in colour. And this unlucky fish might be coming home to the smoker. The southern part of the Murray-Darling Basin offers anglers a variety of pristine rivers to target trout. Perhaps the most famous in Victoria's subalpine area is the Golden River. This river is considerably wider than the Rubicon and occasionally gets topped up when vast amounts of water are released from the Eildon catchment. All the connected tributaries benefit from this influx of water, especially in summer if levels have dropped too low. Wearing waders ensures you can position yourself to cast at likely looking spots. When fishing these areas, it's important to be persistent. One or two casts over a pool probably isn't enough. You need to keep working. It's a rewarding feeling to see the speckled back of a brown dodging and weaving, jumping and trying to outmanoeuvre an angler. These fish really are an asset to recreational freshwater anglers. I was fortunate enough to have caught a number of fish for the trip and kept two for my family. Smoked river browns was certainly one way of convincing the kids to eat healthily. I'll just more walk backwards if you grab the leader. Yep, no worries. Right, eh? Mm. Stroke Pro Flax Spinner does it again for you, Dan. Yeah, nice little fish, very healthy. I like the, the colours on it, really beautiful and white. That's it. We made a short move, we've come over to the Goulburn River. The section that we're actually fishing is not too far from the weir wall. Most of the fish will be all making their way up here, so this is a great place to target them as they all stock up and make their way up to the wall to spawn. The Alpine ranges of Victoria and New South Wales offer excellent trout fishing prospects. These high altitude bushlands are still very much wild and adventurous anglers can access remote river systems by either four wheel drives or hiking in behind the lock gates of the national parks. A trip into the wilderness seeking trout is much more than just chasing fish. It's respite from the modern world, substituting concrete for trees and traffic for bird life. The raw Australian bush is still pristine and those who put in the effort can expect the rewards. Camping by the river is perfect for families and those who enjoy the serenity of the bush. Most likely, you will be the only person for miles if you choose the most remote river systems, so it pays to be prepared. The high country plains have numerous rivers feeding the surrounding areas and fishing these systems has to be seen to be believed. An angler can lose many hours simply enjoying the landscape and immersing themselves in the excellent fishing. Trout aren't native to Australia and some may argue they don't belong here. But to those who crave the sight of a spotted brown trout, they're a welcome addition to our rivers. And in the end, if the fishery isn't causing harm to our native fish, surely there is a place for brown and rainbow trout in these waters. The fishery is currently well managed and anglers are at the forefront of defending and striving to keep these species from being decimated by natural disaster or by those who consider them an unnecessary intruder in the cold river waters of southern Australia. Since 1973, Strike Pro has led the way in lure design. Whether you're a recreational angler or tournament pro, Strike Pro provides the very best lure option for your target species. Anglers around the world trust in Strike Pro to connect them to that next fish. Join the revolution, casting into the future. Strike Pro, available at all good tackle stores.